Welcome to a lecture on forest management terminology as it is um, used in Ontario. So let's start off about the land base for Ontario so we have a better understanding of what we have. Well first of all what we have here is the productive forest land is around 52 percent over the entire uh, land area of the province. The forest area, the excuse me, the uh, lowland areas can be seen as representing 14 percent of the entire area and remember that's different than when we then, oops, excuse me, uh, when we talk about wetland. Wetland is 9 percent and then of course water water is 18 percent in the category that that is rather mysterious the other category um, what they are talking about there is tree uh, excuse me residences cities and etc like that so anything which is has been now you um, uh, or ro streets and roads which have essentially been asphalted. So that's basically the breakdown of the province. So we're working with 52% of the area, productive forest. In that productive forest, in our very large province, uh, we have four distinct areas. And those uh, areas, and I'll start from the top, is the Hudson Bay Lowland, and the Hudson Bay Lowland, which is located here, that's where all the stunted uh, small trees are located. Above that is an area which is totally void of trees, tree growth. And below the uh, Hudson Bay Lowlands is the Boreal Forest. And this is the area which crosses all the way across the country, all the way over to Quebec. And uh, this is the major forest area of Canada. The Great Lakes St. Lawrence area, which is unique to Ontario, is uh, a mixture, and you saw that at Fall Camp, and that's a lot of uh, mix of oaks, and then you have your pines, white pines and such. And then the deciduous forest, which is way down here, is tucked away, is uh, it's, it's predominant with the oaks, the maples, and even things like tulip tree when you get way down here, and the more exotic uh, trees that you would find there, the cucumber tree. Now the province, uh, again, uh, a big and very important part is uh, that the province now is broken apart into eco zones, and this is very important. And these eco zones, what they uh, do is um, indicate the actual areas of potential growth throughout the province. So to we'll give you an example, if we look at the, the boreal forest again, you can see that this of course ties very close to those region, regions we just talked about. So this is the boreal region and inside that boreal region there's 3E, 3W, and then 3S and so on. And these are all specific uh, eco zones. And if you go down here, and Ontario is 5E, 4E, and then for us, always when we ch talk about in Southern Ontario, we talk about 7E and 6E being our uh, predominant uh, eco zones. And that's what they are, okay? And just to give you a perspective, Forestry Field Camp was located right here, right above Algonquin Park. And currently you're sitting right here in 6E. Now, an important thing to understand is some of the terminology. And, and one of these uh, points to understand is this term here, the area of undertaking. Very strange name. Uh, but, but the area of undertaking, really what that means is that it's the the area that is going to be managed for forestry on for on crown land 
So if you notice, uh, the, um, let me see, I'm just trying to get a pen here going. So I can, there we go. So when you, when you uh, see here, uh, there we go. See here that there's hardly, uh, this is not part of the area of undertaking, and that's because it's private land. Most of that's private land. And you can see small segments which are either uh, parks or, for example, here, uh, or they're part of cities, okay? So the area of undertaking is all this gray area, which is crown land. And so um, the definition, and you're expected to, uh, in the course of, the, uh, in the, during this course, uh, we expect you to uh, read the definitions on your own time. I'm not going to read every word of it here, but I expect you to understand the terminology expressed here. So, understanding that there is a area of undertaking in the province, and it has now been broken apart into categories. And these uh, categories, um, what they are, uh, are called management units. And the management units are changing over the years. Uh, what they're basically doing is amalgamating some of them over the province. And if you're just trying to get an idea of what, where the heck am, what, what am I looking at, uh, right there is Algonquin Park, and you were working right over here uh, for the Ottawa Valley, and we were, and the Nipissing Forest Management Unit is right here, okay? And this is the Trent uh, Severn, uh, excuse me, the French Severn uh, Forest Management Area. West Wind is manage, manages that area, okay? So it gives you an idea uh, where you are. You can always tell Gonquin Park by that classic shape there, all right? So in Ontario, there's roughly around 40 management units. And you can see, uh, certainly, uh, the uh, colors, uh, the color, all the different colors of the units, okay? So that just gives you a perspective of what's, uh, that, and why are there all those different units out there? It's because they are of different eco um, sites for that area and for different users. And so the force has been divided into these area so that the companies uh, so that excuse me that companies can manage those areas and that's the intent you get you allocate an area for management now before we uh, now we're going to dive into the different uh, acts and acts are if you don't know what an act is well um, uh, just think about there's a traffic act everyone knows that one and the Traffic Act basically makes rules and regulations on how we should act on the, on highways and byways. So same goes for forestry. And there's a number of acts, and we're just going to walk through them very, very uh, superficial, but at least uh, give you an idea. So the Environmental Act is the first one we want to look at. And, uh, and that one there is the one that overrides everything. And the purpose of it is, and it's a good purpose, is to provide protection and wise management of Ontario's environment. And that, and that includes everything. Environment includes everything out there, not just the forest. It provides a systematic way of evaluating activities that people want to do, be it mining, forestry, hydro dams, tour, uh, natural resource tourism, whatever the case, okay? And, and applies to the undertaking of forest management on crown lands. So there's that strange word again, right? But the undertaking of forest management. So it applies to what we need to do. So the Environmental Assessment Act, and as far as we're going to go with, with that act, that's its overriding uh, energy, Now, uh, along the way, we have also on the very, that, so that was on a grand scale, and then on a very minute scale, 
we have, well, on a smaller scale, we have the Forestry Act. And now it's kind of interesting because it addresses uh, on private lands. So what can we do? Well, the, one of the things is the Managed Forest Tax Incentive Plan, and which is called um, an agreement. And uh, so the ministry works with different organizations to make that happen. And so here you can see, and we, you folks, are going to write a MIFTIP, as it's called, a Managed Forest Tax Incentive Program Plan, and you're going to write one near the uh, end of this course. That's So this is all under the Forestry Act. Now the big one that we're going to talk about is the Crown Forest Sustainability Act. And generally speaking, when you see it, people don't say just all those words. They just um, call it that, the CFSA. And the, it, what it does, uh, the Crown Forest Sustainability Act, is again to manage... Uh, to ensure we provide for the sustainability of crown forests, which are located in the area of undertaking. So the official document is dusty as can be, but it is the thing that creates your, your employment because it, it talks about all the rules and how we manage that crown forest. Remember what crown forest is, right? Crown forest is forest that belongs to you and I in, in the province of Ontario. Forests belong to the province, to the people of the province. So managing crown forests, uh, what is entailed? You need to follow the rules, you have to have a management plan, and you have to ensure that, that actually audits occur. So again, I want you to read all these documents and uh, I'm just giving you the overview and so that you understand, okay? Now, under the Crown Forest Sustainability Act, you have to um, proceed and write a forest management plan, right? And this forest management plan, uh, how do you write it? You just don't make it up. Is that there's specific rules, what's expected, and we're going to go through all that in the uh in a future uh, lecture, but it talks about how do you collect the inventory, how do you get licensed for that, how do you carry out forest operations, how do you follow the rules, how will you ensure you enforce those rules, and how do you pay for forest renewal. So there's a lot of meat in inside this particular plan. And just to prove to you, there's a, a lot of um, acronyms in this uh, crazy sport we call forestry. Uh, what I've done here, let me just get rid of that arrow. Is that, oops, let me try that again. Eventually I'll get this. There we go. Uh, is that when we look at, just look at this particular little line, and we speak a lot in acronyms, abbreviations in forestry. Each SFL for the FMU managed must prepare a FMP to the standards of the CFSA. What a mouthful. So each sustainable forest license for the forest management unit managed must prepare a forest management plan to the standards of the Crown Forest Sustainability Act. And so how do you prepare a proper plan? Well, you have to follow different, you have to follow different manuals. And we'll just go over them. We're not going to read them all. We're going to just introduce you to some of them, and some of them you will be buying for your program, for your different courses. But before we dive into all the um, um, different guidelines, let's see what the heck is an SFL. And again, you will need to probably come back to this to read this, to digest it. A sustainable forest license. So really what that does is that a sustainable forest license uh, is a license, a permission to operate on a particular forest management unit or units, and usually it's done by forest companies. Now, if a, and so this is so the SFL holder 
is in charge of a number of things. And uh, so what uh, what are they in, char in charge of? And uh, let me just see if I can get this going. Here we go. So what they are in charge of is management planning, harvesting, ac road construction, forest renewal, maintenance, monitoring. So there's a lot. That basically, you have to do everything. And you have to follow the regulations of the MNR to make it happen. So you just can't, you know, wishful thinking. So to get a license, it's like a car license, but it's for managing a forest. You get a license and it is, uh, the, the, the license is renewable up to 20 years if you do a good job, right? And uh, that's what forest companies strive to do, of course because they need that land as a resource for their uh, particular um, uh, plants, be it a pulp mill, sawmill, whatever. Okay, now sustainable forest licenses can be one large company managing it or many small companies combining their efforts to uh, have a sustainable forest license, as for an example in the Nipissing area. So, a sustainable forest license. Uh, uh, let's take a look at that. They, so, they must work with the government and others to prepare the plan. They have to make a uh, whoops. They have to make a annual report. Uh, they must monitor. Uh, no, Lord, let me just. They must um, monitor their work and uh, they have to, of course, reforest the area along the way. And then an important part is, along the way, is they have to provide, they have to pay stumpage. And we will talk about what's, uh, uh, what stumpage is. That's something that we will address in, in another lecture. Now, here's an example of an SFL I told you about. So when you look at it, this is the, uh, here's Algonquin Park again, and you guys were uh, harvesting forest here and uh, sleeping here at the Canadian Ecology Center. And this is the Perry Sound area. There's Georgian Bay, okay? And uh, so you can see this is the one, this is an, uh, this is a uh, SFL, and it represents 2.1 million acres, or 885 well, about, uh, let's say, three-quarters of a million hectares. So it's a lot of land, and it's all public land. But this is a really interesting area because there's private land intermixed in here, cottage lands, and Aboriginal um, uh, reserves. So it's a very complex area. And you can see here, and this here, I've added this, you can see all the townships that are included, incorporated into here. And they have to manage this area on a sustainable basis forever and the person who manages it happens to be a graduate from the college Steve Monroe now the other uh, type of if you don't have an SFL which is in other words you're a big company or a large consortium of companies uh, to to manage the area what the government has realized well let's give opportunities for people who which uh, are from all the, they're very small operators. So what they do is they allow FRLs uh, to, these are people who, and all their key objective is to have permission to do uh, quality removal of trees uh, or some kind of activity on, within an SFL. So what happens is, and I provided you here with a, a number of examples of, of, for example, Grant Forest Products, a hardwood user may be issued an FRL forest resource license on a sustainable forest license held by a conifer user, such as Domtar or Tembeck. So that means you're getting, you're using the land base for poplar resource and for spruce by two different companies. So it's very effective. So small companies are usually uh, provided these type of 
and here you can see right here small companies and then they usually last five years while a SFL lasts for 20 years so it's another term and just understand that SFLs are the large ones are the large initiatives so companies with SFL work with government and others prepare and implement a forest management plan now wouldn't it be it be nice and simple but there's a challenge because when we have such a vast a vast province as we do you can see we have all these and this is broken down very uh, very graphically to the uh, different eco zones um, and you can see that we have to address that so forest management is quite different down here in southern Ontario or let's say down here in the Ottawa Valley versus way over here or up here in the caribou um, management unit so the challenge is how do we do that and uh, that was good fun uh, what we do is we have different guides or, or uh, 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 to prepare a plan and a guide is basically a bo uh, booklet to tell us how do we write a plan so we so not everybody in the entire every different company in, in the province all 42 different SFLs create different documents the government wants consistency way so let's go through some of the terminology that I've just already alluded to a guide okay is not I'm not talking about a guy walking around the bush or a fishing guy I'm talking about a document that contains a direction and in other words standards guidelines and best management practices so you go oh great more buzzwords so what's a standard well if you look at a standard a component of a guide that provides mandatory direction in other words rules in other words you gotta follow this so if you have a cold water stream you need to be back 90 meters no questions asked a guideline though which can also be found in a guide on a topic like for example how to manage for uh, red pine white pine guide a component of a guide that provides mandatory direction but requires professional judgment for it to be applied appropriately at the local level in other words using your forest tech expertise you make some good decisions based on the standard you follow the guideline so sometimes forestry is exciting because it isn't just a pile of rules you have to really think when you're out there and we're going to try to teach that a lot to you guys in this semester best management practices a component of a guide that suggests a practice at an exemplary level of performance. This, would, in other words, they're saying this would be really nice if you can do this, and it's expected for this particular uh, management approach. Okay, so those are the terms. Look at your own time. Okay, so uh, get, uh, whoops, uh, I like that thing, don't I? Uh, so here's more on the subject of understanding. I provided you some more ways and examples of looking at it. So what have they done in forestry uh, for the province? They decided to look at the forest at, at different levels. So they look at landscape, stand, and site. So you have to under get your head wrapped around those three terms because they are all included inside managing a forest. So when we consider a forest, we look at things at a landscape level. In other words, imagine yourself uh, Superman, like way up in the sky, and you're looking at the whole area. So you look at caribou habitat or covering thousands of hectares that could cross many management units. Then you come in closer to the ground, and then you, and you manage things at a stand level, a forest stand level. In other words, you leave a patch of trees like we did at camp, in a cut block or you go down to a site in other words a pinpoint almost for example you notice an osprey nest and you do uh, you deal with it in a particular way putting buffers around that so depending on what level we're looking at landscape stand or site there's different rules well different 
guidelines and how we should manage the forest. And these are very important. So let's take a look at the landscape guide and what does it mean? Okay, so the landscape, like I told you already, is that the landscape guide, you're looking at the forest um, You're looking at the forest structure, age, composition, and we do that in this uh, program. And, and it's just to give you the big picture and how do, when you're managing. And here you can see uh, they've got this satellite image where they're trying to show to you how, when you look at the big picture, how, how the different things influence as far as the vegetation age structure and so the wildlife you'll be doing uh, your arc uh, design project for species at risk and it exactly is looking at wildlife values at a landscape level the, okay and one of the key guides uh, you shall use in forestry is the stand and site guide and especially in, in uh, annual forest planning you'll be using this book and this is a very, very um, all-inclusive book, and it's excellent for talking about things at a stand level and at a site level. So they've combined these two levels. They left landscape out for another guideline, but here you can see they've combined the two, and the manual uh, is online. I'll be showing it to you. And it talks about how do you address the situation of well, how do I manage the, uh, the clumps of trees in the, uh, within a cut block and how many do I leave and what is a good amount for wildlife of different types. Again, take the time to read this. I'm not reading it all to you right now and so you, better under, so you have a better understanding of stand and sight guide. Now, the stand and sight guide are great for giving you the you know for wildlife and then comes the challenge is um is figuring out let me see try that again the silvicultural guide and a silvicultural guide tells you what you should do uh, for harvesting renewing and tending the forest and we'll spend a lot more time in the silviculture course talking about that but with our famous book called big blue you will learn some of that uh, this semester so again the whole approach is when they're writing a forest management plan how do we properly manage the forest to have a forest forever based on recognized guidelines made by professionals so in this province what we have is we have a number of guidelines and they're based on where uh, the, where the uh, it's actually located, uh, the forest that you're studying. In our case, you can see the Silvicultural Guide to Managing Southern Ontario Forest. That's your required book for third semester. And then you'll be also buying later on the Ontario uh, uh, next semester, the Ontario Tree Marking Guide, which is an excellent book. And using many of these others, for example, this one, these ones in your annual forest planning course. Again, civil cultural guides give us directions on how to manage the forest wherever it's located in this large province. The other ones we won't spend a lot of time on, but we should make you aware of in the uh, when they prepare a forest management plan in the province is this one called the Resource-Based Tourism Values Guide. This is massively important, especially if any of you, which I'm sure there are, uh, love to hunt and fish and be in the bush. And I mean, that's why you're here in this program or at this school. Well, that's a lot of resource-based tourism values. And we have to protect those as we do use the forest for uh, extraction purposes and, how, and, and minimize the impact. So there's a whole guideline around that and we talk about that in your annual forest planning course in greater detail but that's one of the manuals required to prepare a plan in this province 
Here's some examples. This is the actual uh, cover of that uh, manual, that guideline. Okay, and I've just taken a few uh, excerpts out of there, and just to give you an idea, of some of the things it covers. For example, this one here talks about noise control and things you need to do that if you have a remote camp nearby. Okay, and then down here, you know, water crossings, how to minimize. Uh, roads and 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 not disrupt uh, canoe routes and so on and water crossings uh, should have to be removed on tertiary roads in other words very tiny little roads where there's harvesting okay so you don't disrupt uh, the tourism aspect so not for wildlife just we're talking about for tourism the other one that's a big deal is uh, is the uh, Cultural Heritage Values Guide. Our forest areas have many, has a lot of rich history, and be it all the way back, of course, from the Aboriginal times to the pioneers, there's a lot of history that cannot just be forgotten, and we want to really maintain that. So in here, the Cultural Guide provides uh, how, what are the categories? Arche archaeological sites, Okay, sites of archaeological potential, cultural landscapes, and Aboriginal values. So forestry has to incorporate also these elements to make sure they're not lost in the process of using the resource. I've provided here some examples, and right down to, this is the cover of the book, the guideline that, that has to be used. And you can see here, I've just taken some excerpts out how elaborate it can be if, if there's an archaeological dig and then historical uh, Aboriginal values, very important that they are kept. And if you case you're wondering here, this is a really famous way of making planks uh, from uh, cedar, large old growth cedar trees. And there are some remnants from an old, old sawmilling uh, operation. So there's all kinds of regula uh, guidelines and uh, approaches, standards, to making sure we protect our cultural heritage values. The other things that are not included in this, um, uh, that are outside the five guides I've just talked about, uh, they are listed right here. These are the key ones. The... Uh, so we have aerial spring uh, guide manual, the access to road manual, which you'll be uh, using extensively next semester, prescribed burning manual, talk about that in forest fire science, and selected wildlife and habitat features inventory manual. And we'll address some of that this semester. Okay. And then also very important along the way, and it's becoming more and more important, of course, are the uh, ecosystem guideline here, uh, which is now really making a big push to be now the standard approach in uh, managing our forest, and rightly so, we should be managing it based on ecosite. So these are the guidelines which exist besides the five I've just addressed. So you can see there's a fair number of manuals involved, guide like, excuse me, and guides to encourage uh, a good forest management plan being prepared. So the auditing, of course, after you've done all that work, uh, you have to make sure that it's done right. And then once every five, ten years, uh, the Crown Force Sustainability Act requires that we check out the work. And on the uh, PowerPoint presentation, you can, which you can also is provided, you can uh, link. Oops, you can. Uh, Go to the actual Ontario 2011, Ontario State of the Forest, and you're going, why 2011? Because they only make it every five years. So that is the most current one. And you can see uh, how Ontario forests are being managed. Certification, uh, we'll be uh, talking about that later in another uh, lecture. And that's a very important element is certification. You may have seen green check and all kinds of different approaches 
um, on managing, making sure that our forests are, meet the standards. And that, I think, is a wonderful, wonderful thing. So certification will be addressed later, and we'll just go over some of the elements there. So you can see now from all the things that have been discussed, these are all the elements that need to be used in preparing a forest management plan. The five guidelines and a good understanding of forestry is what you're getting here in the program. And also a, a good understanding of the Crown Forest Sustainability Act. And that's the end of this lecture.